Welcome to this edition of The Technology Pill, a podcast that looks at how technology is reshaping our lives every day and exploring the different ways that governments and companies use tech to increase their power. My name is Gus Hossein, and I'm the Executive Director of Privacy International. And, as ever, I'm joined by Caitlin Bishop. Hello! So this is the Planes, Trains, and Automobiles edition of this podcast. Or, in a pandemic, it's the Cargo Planes, Motorhomes, and Beach-slash-Basement Quarantines edition of this podcast. And we are again joined by PI staff who can tell us their stories. We are actually joined by three lawyers this time, but they're talking about something much more human than the law. We are an international bunch of people at PI, and for like many people, the very concept of home is, well, complicated. And a pandemic with closed borders makes us all so very hard. And we are also travelers at heart. We recorded this podcast over the summer as we were all trying to travel. I was able to travel to Greece and Canada to see family and, well, there's no word or set of words that can quite capture how beautiful and important that was to me to be able to do that. And so despite the uncertainty, the testing, and the vast anxieties of not even knowing if borders would let me or loved ones in, and of course, quarantine enforcement. It just had to be done this summer. Like I think before going on holiday, traveling somewhere, it was a nice to have, not a need to have. Whereas now when you've been stuck at home and you've had to be, it's a desperately need. It's not like, you know, you're picking August over September or this year, not next year, because convenience, time, oh, you know, it's been a while. Maybe we should see them. Maybe we shouldn't, you know, I'd love to go to here. This time it's been, you absolutely have not been able to. And it's that, I think, not having the option that has made it so much more important. Like, I haven't left the country. I don't have family elsewhere. But I've also spent more time (laughs) on the road or not at home than any other time that I can remember at the moment. Like, being anywhere else is, is the change is amazing. Even if it's, you know, driving up the road and sleeping in a motorhome for a bit as long as it's somewhere different. But even getting away has been so stressful and I haven't gone anywhere, (laughs) you know. So we felt it was essential to document the hurdles that were introduced in global travel over this period. When we started this podcast, we thought that we were documenting some new normal. But as the summer passed, we realized that we were documenting a level of insanity that was unevenly and arbitrarily applied by governments. And based on our experiences over the past 20 years of dealing with border and travel security and surveillance, we're very concerned the mindset that governments currently have will dominate well after the pandemic unless we are very clear that we're not willing for this to continue. So in this podcast, we will navigate the geopolitics of COVID rates, countries being reduced to color categories, the complexities of testing and their geopolitics of vaccination and vaccination passports. And amidst all of that are human stories. First, we are joined by Ksenia Bakina, a British and Russian national living in London. Ksenia, over the last year, you've had some particularly interesting, if not harrowing, travel experiences. <laughs> First, I was wondering if you could just tell us where you've been so that you can recount to us the experiences. Yeah, sure. So mainly, most of my trips have been going back to Russia, because that's where I'm from, that's kind of where my family is, and that's where I often have to go to deal with various issues. But I've also been to me around July last year, and Portugal recently in June 2021. Okay, so you have encountered not just a number of countries, (laughs) and these are particularly interesting countries, but you've also encountered different phases of the pandemic, not just for where you are domiciled, which is in the UK, but in each of these different countries, they were facing different stages of the pandemic as well. Yes, absolutely. And when you travel, it's really hard to keep up with what is going on in the particular country in terms of not only sort of travel requirements, but also what are the restrictions. 
I think last year when I was in France, I was really lucky because I managed to get into France and get out within that grace period where the borders between France and the UK were okay. And so it was quite easy with the fact that I may have needed to isolate when I returned. But back then, there was still no requirements for testing. I think the forms were just coming in. So I think I only really needed to fill out a form on the way back to the UK. So it seemed a lot easier while things were sort of having this grace period in between lockdowns. And I think I was so fortunate because when I just when I got back from France, I think a week or two later, it went back to being off the permitted list. We're comparing that with Portugal in June 2021. That was a lot more challenging in trying to figure out how many tests do I need? Where do I find this form? And what are the exact requirements? I can't even imagine. And, and then for Russia, what kind of requirements were, were there to get into Russia, mm -hmm. even traveling yeah. as a citizen? Well, it was easier to get in. It was much more problematic to get out. <laughs> <laughs> so... I've traveled several times. The first couple of times were okay, but I think the most traumatizing, I've traveled to Russia on actually 19th of December, 2020. So I actually made it out of the country a few hours before we went into stage four of the lockdown. Stage four was the surprise immediate lockdown of the UK in response to what at the time was known as the uh, Kent variant or as the Alpha variant. And basically the Christmas holiday plans of the entire country were canceled. You managed to get out right before that announcement, which is quite an achievement. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't believe my luck because I think my flight was late in the afternoon, but from midnight on that same day, the country was going into a stage four lockdown. But what I hadn't anticipated was the fact that many different countries would follow sort of UK's example and set their surprising restrictions on all travel to the UK. So what actually happened was two days after I arrived in Russia, less than 24 hours given of notice that we're now stopping air travel to the United Kingdom. And it was very confusing because initially also the government authorities said that it's only just for one week, but these weeks kept being extended. And so my flights were cancelled in the end and you were sitting there and hoping that they would lift this one week restriction. But of course, that didn't happen. So getting out of the country was very problematic. I was trying to find a way to fly to the UK through a third country. But the situation was really strange because A, lots of countries have stopped uh, communications with the UK and B, Russians have always had very restrictive travel. So I needed to find a country that A, Russians could get to relatively easy and B, that still maintained the connection to the UK. And on top of that, I was really nervous about the fact that the time delays were for flights, things were changing by every hour. And I was really concerned that even if I get to, for instance, Dubai, by the time I get to Dubai, Dubai might stop their flights in the UK too. Oh my God. <laughs> and, and just to be clear, like it, it's not that the UK government had closed its borders. It wasn't no. that you were trying to do something that was illegal. Like the border no. remained open. It's just these other countries are responding to the UK's public health situation. Oh, that's crazy. Yes, absolutely. And so I spent a lot of time researching all these options that were available. And I was really fortunate because actually, and God bless social media, because I found out on Instagram that Aeroflot still does flights direct between Moscow and London. But they call them cargo flights. Oh, really? And, and it's just because I saw that an acquaintance of mine that I follow on Instagram somehow flew out of Moscow and London and London. So I immediately messaged her and said, oh, my God, how is this possible? What have you done? And she said, yes, Aeroflot is contacting me flight. So I immediately called Aeroflot and said, is this true? Is it happening? And they kind of said, yeah, you know, they're not official. We don't advertise them. But we can take you in, we just can't bring you back. So it's called a cargo flight, but we're taking passengers if you have a visa or if you have a residence permit to the UK, but we're not bringing any passengers back from the UK. Wow. In a sense, I'm glad that kind of 
option exists because it got you back, but it's also that's just crazy to be to consider passengers as cargo. What was it actually like to fly on? Was it like a normal plane? Yes, I was also worried about that. So, oh my God, they call it cargo plane. Am I going to have a box on my knee to ask my travel? But <laughs> actually, what they did was half of the plane was completely blocked off. So, when you entered, the seating arrangement started from number 15. So, half of the plane was left with seats. And the half that you had seats was absolutely normal. So you actually were given food. You could watch a film on board. So it felt like a normal plane journey. And I was just so relieved because for me, flying directly to Russia from Moscow to London was so much safer because I thought even if by the time I get to the airport and the plane a flight flight gets cancelled, I am still home. You know, I'm not stuck in a third country yeah, yeah. on, you know, in Because that, that would have been problematic from Dubai where you could have been stranded there uh, on your connection or some other yeah. country where you don't have legal status. Wow. What airport did you land at? Was it the regular Heathrow or was there like a special airport for cargo? Yes, I landed at regular Heathrow airport and I was surprised by how little checks there were at the time because also... I was expecting, I think maybe the form that I filled out, I had to fill out the location form beforehand. And I think that was looked at, but I went through, I signed my passport through the electronic gate. I walked out, no checks of any kind for temperature or for anything like that. So it was actually really easy to, to get out of the airport, to my surprise. Wow. Have you found that the amount of stuff going on at the airport with checks with forms all that stuff has ramped up like fairly linearly throughout the pandemic or has it been up and down across your different kind of flights i kind of find that my latest trip to portugal was a much more difficult trip than when i've traveled before because now a lot more checks are in place i remember even when i landed from portugal into the uk i couldn't use the electronic gate Everyone had to queue from all the nationalities. The queue was enormous. And so it was much, much busier. I think they may have actually looked at the test at the airport as well as before boarding the flight to the UK, but I'm not sure. But I just, I remember that last time in June, it was much busier and much more frustrating than it was in the early stages of the pandemic where these measures were sort of were thought about but weren't fully in place. Did you have to quarantine in other countries upon arrival or is your quarantining experience solely limited to the UK upon return? My quarantine experience is solely limited to the UK because, for instance, in Russia, luckily every time I've done a test upon arrival in Russia, it's been negative, so I've never needed to quarantine. And it's quite easy to do because in Russia, there's a testing station in the Russian airport. The moment you land, it's kind of by the exit, and there's a queue, and they take your sample. You pay there and then, and then you get your results really, really quickly, actually, definitely within 24 hours, but usually even before that. So that was a PCR test, not a lateral flow then? Yes, it, it, it was a PCR test. Yes, yes. But in terms of quarantine, so the only time I've quarantined is in the UK. And it has been more or less manageable, but I'm certainly noticing that because I've done it several times and the cumulative effect of having several lockdowns in the country that were quite lengthy lockdowns, that the more you have to isolate, the more my psychological kind of state deteriorates. Because even just returning from Portugal in June, and I've had to isolate for 10 days after we've just come out of a lockdown in April and we're still sort of in between lockdown, yeah. it's just getting so much harder psychologically to take because it's like, how much longer can I just be stuck indoors? So yes, and I mean, I think it's good that at least there is option to end your quarantine early because it really is a rescue, I think. So you can end your quarantine after five days instead of the full 10. But I think the problem is that the prices for the tests are so high and the amount of tests you have to do, even for mandatory testing, because you obviously have to do a PCR test before you fly out or an antigen for some country, which causes a bit of confusion, but usually it's PCR. Then you also have to do a test before you fly back into the UK, 
which I actually wasn't even aware of when I went to Portugal. I thought it's come with your British passport and fly in and then do just the day two and the day eight test. Yeah. And then you have to do day two and day eight if you fly to a number country. So that's just four mandatory tests in their own right. And the prices are, you know, 80 pounds, 100 pounds per test. So you're looking at over 200 pounds of mandatory testing. So getting that early release test for day five, which will cost you another 80 pounds, can be really problematic. Absolutely. And so, so you kind of have to figure out, well, what do you value more? Your psychological state and, you know, wanting to finish the quarantine early so you can you can go out and you can at least see people around you? Or is it 80 pounds because you can't really afford to spend more when you've already spent over 200 pounds per person? Yeah, absolutely. So you traveled a lot to, like, see family and do admin stuff. You know, like, what did traveling mean to you, I guess? Like, there was a lot, obviously a lot of work. How important was it to be able to travel? I think it's really important for people to travel. I think in the 21st century, it's not about traveling just for a nice holiday. There are so many, you know, people with two, three passports where they have not only sort of family members that they want to see, but also various responsibilities in the other country. And so I think it's really important to be able to travel because we are very international. It's not just about going for a one-week holiday on the beach, but it's actually much more than that because it's about connecting to your family. It's about helping them, especially during this pandemic. It's been so frustrating when we were in lockdown, and I knew that my family, you know, some members might have been sick, some members were really struggling psychologically, and you just want to be there to support them. So it's really important to actually be able to go out of the country and get back in in the smoothest way possible. We have to remember that the world has changed in the past 20 years, maybe even longer, where the movement across borders is part of our makeup. And the fact is, under the pandemic, for the first time in 20 years, borders became thicker. And that affects our identity. That crystallizes so many of the feelings I've had over the last year and a half without quite being able to articulate it. So thank you for that. Our second colleague joining us is Ilya Sietsitsa, a Greek national currently residing in Geneva. You've been traveling quite a bit, both last year and this year, right? Yes. Where have you been? Well, I mainly went back home to Greece. My family is there, so I wanted to visit. And then I also had the opportunity to isolate at the house by the beach with full sun and good weather, and so I couldn't miss that opportunity. What's it like this year as compared to last year? Honestly, I didn't notice a big difference between traveling in summer 2020 from traveling in okay. summer 2021. <laughs> One funny difference is that last year we had to fill our contact tracing forms on paper in the plane, mm. and basically uh, the flight attendants were sharing three pens with the entire plane. Uh, and <laughs> that was a very COVID friendly uh, experience. But then this year, uh, everything has become digital. So there was no such um, germ exchanging uh, inside the plane. And then the other thing that changed is like this time you needed to have your contact tracing form from the government that you need to fill 24 hours in advance. And then you needed to have your PCR test which you didn't need to have last year. And while I was checking in, the guy at the counter also was very convincingly suggesting that my dog needed a PCR test. <laughs> and uh, he really convinced me. I had a 30-second panic attack <laughs> until I realized that uh, he was joking. But he was quite convincing, especially because you go through all these checks. And I had failed because I couldn't download my correct PCR certificate and so I had to go back download it through another device so I was quite stressed by the time I reached the counter so I'm there and he's like and your dog's PCR uh dogs not in a PCR no no they do where is your dog's PCR you cannot travel sorry <laughs> Real. that's quite a harsh joke like exactly because you have all these forms to film by now and Travel is no longer, we're not longer used to it. I mean, I traveled last summer 
but then I hadn't traveled this year. It, it was months and you're utterly un unprepared and you feel you it's the first time you travel after mm -hmm. ages. You're stressed to tick all these boxes and you're right there. You're like, I almost made it. And they stop you. Your dog specifically. <laughs> oh, what was the airport like? Was it really empty? Because you, you were traveling from Switzerland, right? It was not crazy busy. Like it was not its usual crowded queues and lines. You still could float through it quite quickly. But then also I heard like two weeks after I traveled, apparently it became an utter nightmare because they've changed the rule where before you could check in in advance and go straight to the gate and they would check your test before you board and everything. Well, now everybody needs to go through the counters. And that has created immense queues of people, even though they have checked in, they still need to go to the front desk to get their boarding pass. And the world has moved past that, so they don't have enough personnel, I think, to do that work. <laughs> I can't remember needing to go to the desk when it hasn't been like a problem. Or I guess when you've got big bags. But I can't remember the last time I travelled with big yeah. bags. Maybe Kenya. Because I travel with my dog and then you cannot check in with your dog in advance. So I, I'm used to having the cues, uh, even though I don't have a suitcase necessarily. <laughs> um, mm. But, uh, you yeah, know, and it definitely doesn't feel like last summer when lockdown measures were lifted and everyone felt that this was over. And then we went back into lockdown. And now I think the vaccines have created the same mm. impression. But this is all over. So people are more respectful, but still I don't feel that distances were always kept in the plane. Okay, you are next to each other in any case. Meh. But uh, on the other hand, like during the flight, they were much more insistent on everybody having their masks on, doing checks all the time, waking up people to put their masks on. <laughs> yeah. Nice, kind of, I guess. I feel like the world again believes that this is over. And I don't feel that way. I feel we are past the first hurdle and then we are mm. waiting for the next variant to change the mix again. <laughs> So like lots of people are getting coronavirus. So lots of people are in proximity of people with coronavirus, which means the UK COVID app pings people to safety self-isolate. And Chris, my partner, went to the supermarket when we got back from our exploration in Georgia, the motor home, and he got pinged to self-isolate the other day. And he, when he came back from the supermarket, he was like, peed off. He was like, everyone got too close. There were so many people. Like how it was before when everyone was very wary and like shuffling down the aisles to make sure they're away from you it's gone and he was really freaked out and then he got pinged to self-isolate and it was like ah uh, yeah yep 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 and i get the like everyone's been released from restrictions here and everyone's like yes <laughs> finally and then there's me in a corner going please my second vaccination's next week please <laughs> leave me alone stay away from me i don't like you no 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 thank you what was quarantining like for you? Because you had a beach. Like, was it was it easier? Definitely. <laughs> with, I mean, with the beautiful view. By the time we reached the beach, there were no strict quarantine rules. It was really nice because we had a big garden and you could go out and then you could go for a swim. And it's a luxury to be able to go to a beach where there aren't many people around you. So you have a 10 meter distance instead of uh, one and a half or two. <laughs> it felt very refreshing. I was very disappointed that I couldn't stay there for the entire winter. Apparently, many people did. Mm -hmm. And it was a completely different island because it's Pladic Islands. They're usually summer destinations. And there are some people, permanent inhabitants, but the, the number decreases considerably. Most of the restaurants close. It's much quieter. But yeah, you're still in nature. The, the islands become green, which you don't see in the summer. But unfortunately, my partner's job demanded that uh, he was uh, in Geneva, where we are based. So we couldn't stay the whole summer there or winter. Boo. But was it nice to see family? Because it must have been a while. Very. It was a great relief and joy and being able to see them. And then with our parents growing older, like uh, they change as well, faster than we used to before. And especially you see the differences from not seeing them for 10 months. Then you're able to see that they are still well, that they're okay. Then for them, isolation was much, much harsher because they are at the um, 
critical age groups. And so they were much more careful and they were much lonelier than we were, for instance. And so it was wonderful that I was able to go and spend two weeks yeah. working from my mom's house, spend time with her, help her with things and just enjoy some time together. Nice. And our final guest is Lucy Audibert, a French and Canadian national also living in London, but residing in France during the recording of this podcast. We heard from her in a previous edition about summer reading. So just to begin, where in the world are you now? I'm currently on the outskirts of Paris in France. I'm at my uh, grandparents' uh, old house, which we just sold and emptied out. <laughs> oh, gosh. Wow. That's exciting. But also hidden within that is that you are in a France that is currently considered, according to the UK classification of countries when it comes to travel, you are an Amber Plus country. <laughs> Amber Plus? I didn't even know that existed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, it's because you're not like every other country in Europe, which is mostly Amber, to allow people to travel for a vacation. But France deserves a special recognition because of the apparent prevalence of the beta variant. The beta variant, yes, yes, which I'd never heard of before and didn't even know we had in France. But suddenly the UK, which is completely overwhelmed by the Delta variant, decides that the beta variant is an issue. <laughs> and so that means you're not welcome back anytime soon. No, there, there, you have to go through a much more arduous process upon return. It means that even double vaccinated, I still have to fully quarantine when I'm back in the UK, which is the only country in the world the UK asks that from, which is ridiculous. <laughs> that's that's extraordinary. Well, yeah, because in other countries, the UK wouldn't even recognize your vaccination. Well, no, because, you, yeah, you as a UK resident, you've been vaccinated according to the NHS. Well, complexity there. <laughs> ah. I got my first dose in the UK and my second dose in France. So I first struggled to get my first UK dose recognized in France, which I ended up managing, but that was a whole thing. And then I got an EU COVID passport, thanks to my second dose in France. But for now, the second dose is not recognized in the UK. So I keep getting pinged by the NHS saying, can you please book your second dose, <laughs> even though I already oh have it. Oh my God. I was hoping I'd run into somebody who had had this experience of getting a vaccination in two different countries because the UK is recognizing that it does have to fix the problem. There's a number of problems the UK's got to try to recognize in order to fix. The first is they want to allow EU tourists to visit and US tourists, and that would require recognition of EU vaccine passport, which is unclear if it does yet recognize it when it comes to requiring quarantine. As you say, if you come yeah. from various countries, you can avoid quarantining if you have the vaccine passport. But also, the U.S. doesn't have a vaccine passport. And so what is it supposed to recognize? Which means currently the only people recognized by the U.K. government when it comes to being exempted from quarantine are those who are vaccinated by the U.K. NHS. And yeah. so you fall into this crazy category of half and half. And so will they recognize you? And according to all the messages you're getting from the NHS app, no, you're not recognized yet. But they're hoping to sort that out by September. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they say. And I really hope it happens before I come back. <laughs> so before we start piling on just on the UK being particularly crazy, can you describe what you had to do in order to get into France? So to get into France, let me try and remember, I had to take an antigen test. 48 hours before my flight to France. That was a fun one because it was a virtual test, which I did remotely in front of a person who was like on the other side of the world who was guiding me into my testing. It was very, very strange. That's the most awkward Zoom call I <laughs> can imagine for the entire pandemic. And we've all had awkward Zoom calls. <laughs> it was. And there was even a, a virtual waiting room with all kinds of people who were waiting to get their their tests done. And then you get called in and I, you have to jump in as soon as you get called in. And then there's this really overly enthusiastic person who's here to guide you into your test. It was really it was surreal. It was still better than having to go somewhere. I was still in the comfort of my own home. But it was extremely strange to, you know, have someone on Zoom being like, 
oh, hey, can you blow your nose now? Can you go and wash your hands? Can you put this thing in your nose? <laughs> yes, a bit oh further, please. I don't want to see the little line on the stick. <laughs> oh, gosh. Holy awkward. <laughs> Oh God. yeah, and, and, and so it's an antigen test, meaning, if I understand it correctly, it's a lateral flow test that you can actually run the test itself. Like you, yeah. you, you then extracted the sample, put it into the dropper, and dropped it onto the thing, and then within exactly. thirty minutes, you had your own answer. It's the same as the test that the NHS gives us for free, but in order to be certified, they need to be overseen by someone, some some medical practitioner. I don't even know if that person was a medical practitioner, to be honest. But yeah, that's the way you get it certified, basically. And then you have to show them the result over Zoom? Is that what happens? Yeah. So you wait until the little test bar shows that it's complete, which takes about 15 minutes. By that time, you're already off your Zoom call. But what you do then is you take a picture of your passport alongside your little test strip and then send it over to them by email. And then they get, send you your, your certificate. And is this a French government sponsored? It's a UK government sponsored thing. I found out about them on the UK government's list of approved providers. The French government said they accepted anything that the UK government I found see. as acceptable, basically. Even though the results might be in English. Yeah, that was fine. Because the French are good about that. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> They can read negative and positive pretty okay. <laughs> okay, because okay. for what it's worth, the UK is only accepting English results. Really? As far as I, I've heard, because oh, the English don't do other languages, apparently. But that's generally <laughs> what we found when it comes to migration. Whenever our, our colleagues are trying to apply for status or that to prove certain things, it always has to be um, in English and certified to be oh, translated God. appropriately. So good luck on that. Maybe we'll see you in October or November at this, right? <laughs> so that was relatively easy in the end. What was a bit more annoying was the amount of paperwork I had to prepare for my flight to France and actually upload it on Ryanair's website because Ryanair will not let you board if you don't have all the paperwork ready and upload it to their site before you board. So that included my antigen test certificate, some, you know, those weird declarations you make in France, like declaration on honor that I don't have symptoms, things like that. Oh, gosh. Another declaration for entry on the territory, because being an ember country, well, the UK was an ember country for France at the time, which meant that UK travelers were not allowed in unless they have a valid reason. Being a French citizen is a valid reason, apparently, to enter, so there's like a little checkbox that says I'm a French citizen. So yes, you had to add all these paperwork and they had to be printed and scanned and stuff, which obviously is a pain nowadays. So yeah, we had to prepare all of that, upload it all to Ryanair's website, take it all with us uh, in physical copies and stuff and, and get to the airport with it. Just for listeners who, who don't know Lucy and the role she plays at PI, she's one of our data protection geeks. And I'm curious to what degree you entrust Ryanair, the, the very airline that doesn't even want you to be able to go to the toilet on the flights that cost money. How much do you entrust Ryanair with what level of sensitive personal data? To be very honest, at that stage, I decided not to ask myself that question. Because you want to see your family. <laughs> I wanted to see my family, exactly. And the existing complexity of it all meant that I did not want to ask another word, add another worry to the whole thing. That said, if I put my mind to it, I honestly wouldn't think I'm that worried. I would tend to trust, maybe not reasonably so, but I would tend to trust companies like that to have proper data protection policies in place and to handle passenger data in a compliant way, just because they've had issues before. That doesn't mean they, they fix them, but you at least hope that they would. So yeah, try. I try not to think about it too much. Yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I totally get it. And I wasn't trying to corner you on that because we all know since 9-11, the airline industry has been quite cooperative with governments when it comes to the transfer of data, but in a regulated sense, like there are laws mm. on books and there are regulations they must follow and there, there are regulators that track these things. But then we remember that BA had a huge data breach yeah. a couple of years ago exactly. and BA was always one of the, sorry to use the, the term, it's a very professional term, it, the assholes of the data protection game when it came to, like they were always the first to to want to hand over data to the U.S. government post 9-11. So the fact that they didn't have great security safeguards was quite shocking. 
but equally, you know, I'm not that shocked. But yeah. uh, but Ryanair, all of a sudden, all these airlines haven't introduced new data systems in order to upload PDFs. It's just we know that these things are hard and these things are hard yeah. to do. And, and it's hard for all of the entire user base of, say, Ryanair to be able to do that. But let's let's hope that Ryanair knows what they're doing when it comes to uploading. Because I, I haven't had that experience of having to upload data to an mm. airline yet. Okay, so you upload everything, you, you get to the airport, you fly, and do they check? So when I boarded the flight, the Ryanair flight attendant who was checking passports was also checking all of our papers. Well, barely checked. They just checked that we actually had the paper. They didn't actually read what was on them. However, when you got to France, nothing was checked. Absolutely zero. And no one got their papers checked because I was like at the end of the queue and I was looking at whether the customs people were checking the papers and all. Nothing. Zero. <laughs> Although they were doing random testing. So they were picking people from the queue and leading them to a testing center. So maybe that's their way of checking. I don't know. And you flew when Delta had really taken off in the UK. So yeah. the UK was like ground zero of Delta for the world. And you would think if France didn't have borders up for European Union member states, that's one thing, but to not have borders up for the UK, that's that's kind of surprising yeah. to me. It was really strange. And the quarantine obligation as well was very strange. So technically, technically we had to quarantine. So on this declaration on honor thing that you sign, it says, I commit to self-isolating for seven days after my arrival in France. However, you don't even give it an address. You don't even say where you're staying. So there's no way of checking. You don't give a phone number. There's literally nothing that they can check. The quarantine rules are that you are allowed to get out of your quarantine place two hours a day to do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> it's not even like, oh, yeah, you can go you know, to the grocery store next door to get some toilet paper. No, you can do whatever you want for two hours. <laughs> wow. Which is very strange. Because the virus doesn't work that way, right? Exactly. The virus will respect your two hours of freedom. <laughs> it only becomes active when you're out for more than two hours. I don't know if it's a, you know, constitutional thing. France has weird constitutional laws. and Well, not weird. I think they're very good. <laughs> but... All of like legal restrictions on movement and general COVID restrictions throughout the pandemic have been quite restrained by the way that our constitution works and allows the state to interfere with our private lives. And so I wonder if it's a feature of that they allow us to get out two hours a day and it's some kind of, you know, trade off that the constitutional court gave to the government to allow them to lock us up. It's interesting you raise that because you're still in France at this very tender moment when the vaccine passports, the legislation was approved over the weekend, if I yeah. understand correctly. And there were also vast amounts of protests, according to international yeah. reporting, about people not necessarily being overly enthused about the passports. So the constitutional settlement managed to negotiate two hours of freedom every day while you're under quarantine. But it's it's not clear at the time of recording whether or not the constitutional, uh, the Conseil Constitutionnel is going to approve the current state of the yeah. legislation. Is that still the case? They're looking at it on the 5th of August, I think. And if I recall correctly, there were some small conveniences added to the late stages of the legislation as well. Not much unlike the two hours a day type of solutions. Exactly. Yeah. It's a huge topic these days. <laughs> There's not a single dinner without talking about vaccines and the pass sanitaire. Talk to us about your experience in Canada, because you have traveled to Canada in this, in this yes. period. And at the time of recording this interview, I'm embarking on a trip to Canada, one hopes, and I'm knocking on my head as I say so. What was that like? So what was Canada like? So I traveled there Christmas last year. The most striking thing when I think back on it is that at the time there was no testing requirements ever for any country I was going to. So testing before traveling was not a thing. Whereas now we feel like it's the number one thing. That's exactly right. Last summer when I was traveling, no testing, no yeah. talk of testing. We actually went and got tested voluntarily because we, we were going to go see parents. And yeah, so, but even getting a voluntary test was a rare thing. Mm -hmm. And now you can't possibly imagine going across borders with that one and that's why we're doing this podcast we want to mark this moment in time because we forgot to do this last year to mark what has travel become and now we get to say okay 
summer of 2021, this is what travel has become. I pray that summer of 2022, we're not seeing a continued escalation of insane measures. Yeah, that's the funny thing, because I feel like last summer, you know, we, we were much more scared about where the pandemic was going, but traveling was way easier than, than this summer. There was no testing, very few quarantines. It was kind of like up to the gods. Whereas this summer is so tricky and, and rules change all the time. They're different between countries. There's two, three, four tests you need to do before you leave, after you get there. There's quarantines everywhere. And I feel like it's because governments have more keys in their hands that they can play around with and, you know, kind of attune the little dials when they want to. I love that imagery. That's exactly <laughs> it, isn't it? Yeah, I do find like traveling this year is way is way trickier. So back to Canada at Christmas last year, Canada was in a rough place at the time, COVID wise. The whole country was pretty much in lockdown. Bars and restaurants had been closed for months and only Canadian citizens were allowed to get into the country. So I was allowed in, but there was an incredibly strict 14 day quarantine. It was the strictest quarantine I've ever done because they would call you every single day, any time of day to check you were here, to repeat all the requirements, the fact that you weren't allowed to share, you know, public spaces with other people in the house, et cetera, et cetera. So I was quarantining in my parents' basement and kind of like just not interacting with them at all. So they would bring me food at the top of the stairs and I would be, you know, just isolating in the basement for 14 days. It's like when you were a teenager and you were grounded. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, after sort of seven or eight days, uh, I started kind of like emerging from, from the basement once in a while to kind of see them. But we were always standing really far apart. We weren't having any meals together. But yeah, it was a time when, you know, there were no vaccines. COVID was still a really scary thing. People were dying a lot. My parents were vulnerable. My sister was vulnerable. I was really, really, really careful. The Canada experience kind of makes clear how strange the France quarantine is. Because like, if the France quarantine of two hours a day had been applied in Canada, that meant for every meal you could go up and yeah. hang out with your parents. And just according to French science, COVID couldn't be transmitted. Yeah, exactly. And the fine for breaching quarantine as well, I should have mentioned that, the fine for breaching quarantine in Canada was up to $750,000 Canadian dollars. The highest fine that was actually applied was $400,000, I think, something like that. So it was applied. It was not just a sort of declarative measure or something. So $750,000, that, that's $500,000 American dollars and about like 400,000 yeah. pounds. That's extraordinary. Yeah. yeah, it's insane. And I actually know some people, like friends of friends of friends, who during their quarantine on their way to Canada from France just couldn't take it anymore after 10 days and just went for a walk to the park near their house. Very unluckily, some police officers were there and lockdown was very strictly enforced at the time. So they just asked them if they had the right to be outside at that time. And they got fined $10,000 oh for literally just going to the park at the end of their street. So it was no joke. Yeah. After 10 days of essentially being locked indoors. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's getting better. Well, no, I would actually say it gets more confusing as things get better. And I think that's what we're seeing in Europe this summer. So Canada has now started to unlock a little bit. As a citizen, I too can travel, but it's unclear. Well, it's slightly clear that my non-citizen wife and son can travel, but we have to travel with marriage certificates and birth certificates and oh my God. Um, because my wife and i are vaccinated we no longer have to quarantine since july 5th i think that was a date there's this non-quarantine for vaccinated people but our young son can't be vaccinated yet and so mm -hmm. he has to quarantine for 14 days and how do you quarantine just one member of a family visiting other family and then you need to have a quarantine plan that you present to the border official. Somehow border officials are now capable of verifying the integrity of a, of a quarantine plan for an eight-year-old kid. <laughs> and what, are they, what happens if they say no? Then we might have to book ourselves into a hotel for two weeks, even though only one member of the family is quarantined. So you can see that once you start opening up a little bit, it starts becoming quite challenging. And so consistency goes out the window, but yeah. following the rules becomes the primary obsession. Yeah. 
And you, you also mentioned the border challenges didn't just apply to you. You had family members who got locked out, essentially. Uh, and, and like this is one of the things we're trying to explore. Is we travel not just because we want to go and see places. We travel increasingly because it's how we live or how we used to live. And our identities are across borders. Our loved ones are across borders. The people we're accustomed to seeing regularly across borders. And these restrictions on travel stop you from being able to be you. Yeah. And you had this hit close to home. Yeah, very much so. Well, so my grandma passed away back in start of November last year. Not COVID, but during COVID, which made everything really hard. And her two daughters, so my mother and my aunt, both live in Canada by fate, not any kind of reason. (laughs) And so, well, obviously they wanted to travel back for their mother's funeral. I was able to come to take care of everything because I was just in the UK and it was a bit easier at the time. I was exempt for some reason from quarantining when I got to France because the special reason for not quarantining, which was attending a family member's funeral, applied to me, but it didn't apply to my aunt and my mom who were coming from Canada. It turned out that my aunt had been in France for a few weeks to take care of various things. So when my grandma passed away, she had already been here, had quarantined, etc. So she was able to be there. But my mom just couldn't. One of the reasons was that she was vulnerable, so she wasn't able to travel from Canada because she had to make a declaration that she wasn't vulnerable, which she couldn't make. And when she got to France, she would have had to quarantine and hence miss her mother's funeral. (laughs) So, yeah, so we had to arrange a sort of virtual funeral, which was something, (laughs) something I never thought I would ever have to do, Um, which was better than nothing. But um, yeah, that's that's when it really, really um, hits home. Gosh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And we start this conversation talking about one awkward Zoom call of you having to test yourself and then end it (laughs) with a very sad Zoom. Well, I guess you had to do it over Zoom ultimately or FaceTime or whatnot to connect yeah, your mom. Yeah, I think it was FaceTime, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I guess after the pandemic, there's no way of compensating for this. It's not like your mom can can suddenly travel to France and somehow capture a missed yeah. moment. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thanks to all the PI staff for weighing in with their experiences and hearing the traumas, the excitement, and uh, and the joys. I was tempted that maybe we should invite a public health professional to speak to us about traveling under COVID, but I then realized it would just be unfair mm. because if, if we give governments the benefit of the doubt here, they're trying to allow something to happen that shouldn't be happening. And they're trying to make it look like they're very confident in what they're doing, mm. that there's a reason to it all. And any public health official would say that, that it just doesn't make sense. But when I'm being a little less kind to governments, I think that they're flailing and they're just doing whatever the hell they can. And they're not afraid to get more cruel mm. because they are terrified of residents complaining about the rise of a new variant because, oh, you let your you let people X in. You let people who came from country Y in. And it's it's always letting people in, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It's never, you know, you went on holiday in exactly. Europe, which is a horrific theme in the UK and in Europe, as you know. You've nailed it. Because like when I was at Athens Airport flying to Toronto, it was the first time in my life I'd ever been at Athens Airport where there were no Europeans there. Mm. It was all Americans and Canadians. Because they were allowed to travel without any interruption from their own countries. And so they're finally getting out. And the flight to Canada was full of Canadians. You could tell by like all the, the Toronto Maple Leafs t-shirts and the Habs t-shirts and all that kind of stuff. And just gave it all away. Whereas usually there's a diversity. But there's no diversity now. It's just, yeah, you're right. It's citizens travel. And this is what happened in the UK in the first stages of the pandemic. The virus didn't come from the outside, as in foreigners bringing it in. It was people on half term, like the the equivalent of March break, who were going skiing in Italy in chalets and then coming back with with an illness. But I mean, I think all of it is getting complicated because we're a global society. Like people move, they move all over the place. People have families scattered all over the place. 
you know and and there are fundamental human connections that exist obviously borders exist but like it's becoming increasingly complicated in terms of the way people live but at the same time <laughs> the climate crisis comes for all of us and there is an ongoing question how do we sustain our familial bonds and our ways of life but like knowing that a lot of it's going to be unsustainable like how do we square those circles and hopefully there's a way around it yeah. like i'm hoping there's a way around it and science comes up with something that means that we don't lose so much of what's brilliant about it you know so much of what's special and important and valuable and meaningful but at the same time like we don't also don't ultimately lose it for good if that makes sense that makes complete sense and it is something that worries me and i'm already calculating doing less travel even as opportunities arise and just calculating travel based on where family is and little less of the discovery which really is horrible but then i'm at a point in my life where i have been to many countries i have had many experiences and so i'm fortunate but the next generation will not necessarily you know why that. they're valuable yeah. like working for pi i've got to go to loads more places than i would otherwise have gone to and like there is value in those experiences in the way that i see the world and the way that i'm you know i, I interact with other people and interact with other cultures and have learned a lot there is value in travel it's not dilettante fecklessness there is value there you know and then the climate crisis comes in like a brick wall and everyone's running into it and, yeah. and saying how do we how do we keep the things that are good and how how do we how do we manage that with like the scariest thing that's probably that is coming for us as a society how do we how do we keep the cultural connections how do we keep the exploration and the learning from other people and all of that stuff like how do we keep it because we need to keep it but we also can't keep going as we're going but then there's another question which is cheap flights are part of the problem right like it's traditionally in the uk it's been very cheap to get like a flight to spain a flight to amsterdam a flight to wherever and trains solve some of that problem but you also don't want to be in a position where you're saying only rich people can travel <laughs> only rich people can live international lives like it's all it's all complicated. I hope smarter people than me are thinking about it. I think they are, but I don't know. I don't know if they are because again, testing increased the cost of everybody to travel, yeah. and it affected some people more than others. Well, I think that's a wonderfully Cleek. <laughs> wide, widening and uh, scary and and thoughtful way to bring this to a close. Thanks everyone for listening and may you all be able to spend time with your loved ones wherever they may be. You can find out more about our work when it comes to travel surveillance and borders and COVID and all these other things by coming to our website at privacyinternational.org. You can like and subscribe to this podcast on the various platforms you use and it's also available on our website. The music is courtesy of Sepia. This podcast was produced by Max Burnell for Privacy International.